the previous tenant of my new flat left a survival guide, part 7, finale hi, welcome to my channel. Today, we're continuing the unsolved horror series from our slash no sleep, that we started. This is the seventh and final part of the series. If you haven't watched the first six parts, you must watch them before watching this one. For those of you that have already watched them, sit back, relax, and grab some snacks. Before we start, if you have some scary personal experiences, that you want to share, feel free to email them to me. Let's get started. When I saw her out the window, garden shears being gripped by both hands and a maniacal expression on her face, I just stood still. I was frozen to the spot in shock. I felt no pain at all from the burn on my face, everything was numb. The relief of eradicating the imposter neighbors and the joy at finding a friend in Derek was hacked away in an instant. Just like every leaf from my shrubs. Why would she do this? What had I ever done to her? Every question possible crossed my mind. I could feel the frustration bubbling inside me, everything about this place just threw up question after question and for every answer I got, ten new questions were waiting to be asked. At that moment in time though, only one was truly important. How did Prudence know? I thought about Terry and her telephone conversations. I didn't want to think that the sweet lady I thought Terry had turned out to be would do that, but it did cross my mind. I thought of Ian the postman, I'd had bad vibes from him for a while, maybe he'd seen Derek coming up the stairs while on his rounds that morning. I stood there frozen pondering all these things until I saw Prudence collapse onto the memorial bench sobbing, head in her hands. She was surrounded by the remains of my attempt at a garden with the shears laid out on the floor. The stairs were kind to me on the way down, it took four flights to make it to the bottom. I ran down the corridor and out the back entrance of the block, no idea what I was going to say. Prudence. That was all I could manage. Nice one, cat. She sat bolt upright before turning and standing quicker than I thought it possible for an old lady. You evil, stupid little girl. Do you have any idea what you've done? She screamed, so much animation in her face that the spaces between her wrinkles pulsated like veins on an angry weightlifter. Me? You think I'm evil? You left that shitty note hidden missing everything I need to know, and got my boyfriend killed. And what you're doing to your own, I screamed, tears beginning to roll, before she interrupted me. Don't you dare talk about her. Her voice cracked and she broke down again, this time falling to her knees, twigs, and leaves sticking to the bottom of her dress. I didn't know what else to do. So I sat down on the floor. I knew that it was probably a bad idea, this woman couldn't be trusted and I hadn't forgotten that, but seeing an old lady crying on the cement floor still made me feel awful. How did you know about the garden? I asked her calmly, trying to change my approach. She shoved a crumpled up piece of paper into my hand, she didn't look at me, her eyes remained on the floor. Dear Prudence. I couldn't exist knowing what I'd done. I should never have told you about it. The last two won't grow stronger, she was never theirs, to begin with. But I have to end her suffering. I'm sorry. Derek. I knew what he had done as soon as I finished the note. Lila, or what was left of her, was gone for good. Of all the creatures only Jamie's killers from the lift remained. That's how Derek had spent the few hours I'd slept between our encounters. This is all your fault. She sniffed. My whole family is gone because of you. That hurt a lot. I trembled as I tried to speak but I always really hated confrontation and I could feel myself starting to glitch. H. How can you say that? I saw. Her and she was trapped in a tiny cage eating dog food and small animals. Your family died in that lift. Just like my Jamie. I may have struggled to get my words out, but I wasn't about to let Prudence Hemmings blame me for her decisions. Lila was better off dead than she was, however awful that may sound. What happened to your face? Prudence growled at me. Take you to visit floor number 9? He did this to her in the first place, not me. And now he's disfigured you. She was spinning things. I could feel throbbing as she mentioned my face, I really should have had medical attention. This isn't his fault. You messed him up and he did that to her because of you. You told me that yourself. I tried ferociously to defend Derek but something inside me still felt uncomfortable about what he had done. I couldn't help it, Lila was an innocent little girl who shouldn't have been punished for Prue's mistakes. This whole thing was such a mess. I was grieving. And then I had her back for all those years, and then I lost Bernie, and then my home and now I have to grieve for her all over again. Prudence continued to cry, but softer. I looked around at the chaos she created and up at the block my boyfriend had died in and rolled my eyes in disbelief that she could be so selfish. She continued. Let me tell you about Lila. She was a beautiful little girl. As I mentioned before, 
I have two other older children, they've had many other grandchildren, however, I hadn't spoken to my eldest two in years even before what happened with Lila. Lila was my first opportunity to get to know one of my grandchildren. Bernie adored her too, always reading her stories and sneaking her sweets. I begged my son to allow her to stay. My children were all incredibly ungrateful, they had it easy growing up and still resented me. I gave them a good, strict upbringing but they didn't appreciate it. They said I was a cruel mother. Lila's dad was the only one I spoke to, but our relationship still wasn't that of a typical loving mother and son. But she was a second chance. It was a miracle when he agreed. I was more shocked he had convinced his wife to allow it. That awful harlot of a woman never liked me, although I didn't like her either. They refused to speak to me after everything, I haven't heard from them since. They had more grandchildren I'll never meet. I knew at the time my relationships with any of my children were over for good. So when Derek gave me a solution I took it. I wasn't entirely truthful when we first spoke. I said I hadn't wanted this, but I was desperate. There was never a way to bring her back safely. Derek explained what she would become to me. He was initially trying to put me off even trying to get her back. I knew exactly what I was getting myself into. But I couldn't pass up the idea of my beautiful little Lila, needing her grandma forever. I suppose I was too ashamed to admit it before. But why should I be ashamed? My altercation with Derek happened after she was back when he tried to kill her the first time. Spouting the same things on that note, what kind of monster wants to kill a little girl? That's why I trashed the garden. He said he wasn't coping with the news of the new block when he suggested it, that he shouldn't have told me it was even possible and she had to die. I hit her until the bulldozers came in. When he disappeared I thought I was safe to spend the rest of my life with her. Bernie hated me. Spending time with Lila was all I lived for, I grew to love her how she was. I felt sick. Listening to Prudence talk brought up so many repressed feelings about Jamie. I hadn't had time to grieve or process anything, I missed him terribly. My old life and my old future felt a million miles away. I was relieved to know that Derek hadn't tricked Prudence, or even intended to create Rat Lila. He was truly good. But she didn't get to have a life. You lived for her but she wasn't living. How could a sane person do that to their flesh and blood? I retorted. You have no idea. This place can make you do irrational things. But she had a life. She had me. It's all she needed. She was certainly right about the building and irrational actions, the pain intensifying on my face throbbed in agreement. But I was still convinced she had lost it Dr. Frankenstein's style where Rat Lila was concerned. She had stopped crying. Her rage levels were rising again. I tried to tell her that it wasn't the child she'd known, but she seemed to have grown an entirely new attachment to the creature that replaced what she lost. Every rational argument I gave was met with increasing levels of screaming. She got less coherent as she went on. The argument was going nowhere, we went back and forth for what felt like forever. After a while, she started to get closer to me. We had both stood up by this point and despite her haggard and frail appearance, Prudence was truly frightening. She looked unhinged. Her words were no longer going in, I was overwhelmed and had too many thoughts rushing through my mind to process her ranting. I took a few steps back clearing a small distance between us. By this point, out of the corner of my eye, I could see neighbors in windows of the block, watching the altercation outside, Prue's screaming had bought a lot of attention. It was bright and I couldn't see well but I turned to scan the windows and did recognize Eddie and Ellie watching from their bedroom, trying to wave at me. They frantically waved and pointed, I tried waving back and gesturing to them, but they kept pointing at me. Why were they pointing? Then I heard it, the garden shears scraping against the ground as Prudence picked them up and charged towards me. You ignorant little bitch. You aren't even listening. You don't deserve my home. You killed her. The twins had been telling me to turn around, I shouldn't have taken my eyes off her. Luckily, unlike my earlier shock when I had first seen her, I didn't freeze. My fight or flight instincts kicked in and I ran faster than I ever have before. I burst back into the building and heard neighbors on the bottom floor lock their doors in a symphony of bolts clicking. I couldn't blame them. Prudence wasn't far behind me and I wouldn't want to take her on in her current state if given a choice. But it didn't stop me pounding on their doors begging someone to call the police, although something told me that in this building that wasn't going to happen. I ran up the stairs, still being followed by her. By the second floor, most were still locked but a few had come out of their homes, armed with a variety of heavy objects. Even in a crisis, I couldn't fault the community spirit here. I ran another flight of stairs that became two but still lead me to floor three and then to the back of the corridor. I pounded on Terry's door. 
My heart was racing but when I turned Prue was nowhere to be seen. I was hoping the people who came out on floor 2 had stopped her but something was odd. I hadn't heard any commotion. This wasn't the end of it. Eddie and Ellie hugged me tight as Terry let me in and bolted the door shut quickly behind me. I told her about what had happened. She couldn't believe what Prue had done. It turned out no one knew about Lila. I was edgy for the first hour. But Prue had disappeared. Terry helped to clean up my burn and put some cold compress on it. She offered to take me to the hospital, but I couldn't. I was too shaken up from what had just happened, I couldn't face trying to explain how I'd sustained my injuries and I still hadn't reported Jamie missing. He still hadn't had any messages from his family, and work had given up calling, but his friends had started. They were harassing me non-stop but I had been too distracted to come up with a decent lie. It had been a week since I moved in and it wouldn't be long until people realized something was seriously wrong. My conversations with my family had been short, with me insisting they didn't visit until we were unpacked and set up. On top of a murderous old lady and an untold amount of abnormal issues, the real-world problems were starting to creep up on me. I sat with Terry for hours, drinking tea and chatting with her. It started to get dark and Eddie and Ellie came into the living room after playing in their room for a while. The voids replaced the big, brown puppy dog eyes again and their claws looked especially sharp, but to me, they were still adorable. Their transformation prompted me to head back to my flat, it was late. I needed to work out what to do next and how to dig myself out of this giant hole. I couldn't just keep planting gardens. I needed to do this myself. I wandered up the stairs, they went on for a while, but nothing too horrific. I passed the man on floor 5, nodding politely and continuing my ascent. I wondered if he'd received the letter of concern yet, he was a little unsettling. When I got to my floor Mr. Prentice was making his animal noises again. I smiled, which hurt my face. After all the madness I was starting to find the seemingly benign horrors of this building oddly comforting. I reached my flat and turned the key in the door before bolting myself in as Terry had. I could feel something wasn't right the moment I entered. The flat was in chaos, which was nothing new because we had only moved in a week ago and I had been too preoccupied to unpack. But things were out of place, the organized chaos wasn't how I'd left it. Then she strolled out of my kitchen. Prudence Hemmings. She was carrying a large carving knife in her left hand this time, she had prepared for her attack. She smiled at me and lifted her right hand, jingling a set of keys that she had entered with. I turned to unbolt the door but she grabbed me from behind before I could turn the handle to open it and held the knife to my throat. I will kill you for what you've done. She whispered into my ear. Without a second thought, I leaned forward just a tad and swung my head back as hard as I could. I couldn't believe that it worked but I must have broken her nose. Prudence dropped the knife and clutched her face, blood streaming between her fingers. I went to grab the knife but she was closer and doing the same thing. I had no other option but to run again. I grabbed the door handle and turned it to exit the flat as she tried to stab me. I was mostly out the door, but her arm was close enough to reach my side, and I felt the knife pierce the side of my torso. I was in searing pain but I didn't stop running. As I stepped outside my flat I could still hear Mr. Prentice's noises flooding the entire hallway. It gave me an idea. I ran towards his door, Prudence stabbing at me frantically with blood gushing from her nose. A few got me as I stopped outside flat 48, the pain was awful and I could feel myself starting to drift out of consciousness, I was losing a lot of blood. I would give my last breath to end Prue. So running on nothing but adrenaline I knocked hard on flat 48 and shouted. Mr. Prentice, can you help me? It was a shot in the dark, I didn't know what would happen but I had to try something. She had stopped stabbing at me, She was enjoying watching me bleed out slowly from the wounds she had already inflicted. I was incredibly weak, and I lost consciousness not long after that, but before I did I heard heavy clunking from the inside of flat 48, chain locks being released and bolts being undone. I watched with blurry vision as a large creature, which I can only describe as a cross between a bull and a wolf, charged out of the flat and trampled the old witch to death. I heard here bones crunch just as slipped away. I woke up in the hospital a day later. My parents were there as were the police I had been found just outside the tower block with my handbag missing, by a neighbor who had been watching from a window as it happened. The police told me that the person had seen the mugging out of their window. They had seen two men approach me and Jamie, splash something in my face, attack us, and when he tried to fight back, they bundled my boyfriend into a car, which the police had been searching for to no avail. He was officially missing. I was baffled but grateful that Jamie's disappearance wouldn't be blamed on me. I went along with it and made out that he had ghosted work to enjoy our first week living together. 
I had been stabbed four times but thankfully in all the right places if there is such a thing as the right place to be stabbed. I lost a lot of blood but I was going to be fine. They were all shallow. They assumed my burns were chemical and happened during the mugging too. The police promised to keep us updated but they still can't find the car. They never will. I wish the story the police had been told were true, it left some hope for Jamie. My parents weren't keen on me returning to the flat after what happened, they said the area was too rough, and that I was living proof it wasn't safe. They offered to collect my stuff for me. I insisted though, told them that I wanted to see how I felt, and they couldn't force me not to. I was released from the hospital two days after I woke up in there. When I arrived at the flats, it was strange. It felt like home. Despite everything, something about this place drew me to it. I took the lift for the first time since Jamie had died. I had two, I wasn't recovered enough to conquer too many stairs just yet, and I couldn't guarantee they'd be kind to me. I smiled at the lack of a button nine and winced at the thought of the creatures. As I reached my corridor I saw Mr. Prentice walking along with his newspaper and milk in a bag. He turned to me and smiled. I wasn't sure you'd come back. It's nice to see you're up and walking. He made small talk as if I hadn't seen him trample a woman to death a couple of days prior. The whole experience had been so disorienting that I started to wonder if I had been mugged and had dreamed the note and everything that's happened since. Then he said something that confirmed everything was real. I never liked that woman. But you've got a real friend in the lady downstairs. He winked at me and turned the key in his door. I got into mine and sat down on the second-hand sofa. I felt empty but relieved. With Prue and the imposter neighbors, all gone the only threat left were the creatures in the lift, who were only a threat between 1.11 and 3.33. Maybe I could start to live a semi-peaceful life in this place. Terry knocked on the door, my handbag, that I had left at hers before Prue attacked in my flat, on her arm. Mr. Prentice was right, she was a good friend. I thanked her for what she'd done and for what she told the police. She said it was pure luck that she found me, she had been walking up to return the bag and found me and Prue sprawled out on the floor. I asked what happened to Prue's body and she just pointed in the direction of flat 48. He was eating it. She said. It's been a few days now and I've decided to stay. I can't imagine going back to complete normality after everything I've been through and I've grown quite attached to some of the quirks of the building. I tried replanting the garden with the help of the twins. I ripped a few stitches doing it and Derek never came. I think he's gone for good. I'm ready to fully embrace life here. The last few days have been hard but there's some time to breathe. Along with the time to breathe, came the time to grieve and I've been grieving badly for Jamie. This leads me to the last thing I have to tell you. Last night I laid in bed, plagued with thoughts of Prue and everything that had happened, but what I couldn't get to leave my mind was how much happiness it brought her to have Lila back. It infected every part of my thoughts. I know you all warned me not to, but I did it. I repeated the ritual. I haven't caught him yet, but I've heard the scratching. Jamie's back. What do you think about this story? What did you feel while listening to this series? Let us know in the comments down below. If you like the video, subscribe to the channel to see more videos and potential series like this one. Hit the notification bell to make sure you never miss an upload.